Boom, chakalaka, we're going to go. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I am Rick Bennett. I'm excited to continue our conversation with Dr. Matt Bowman. You know, last time we talked about Bigfoot being cursed uh, to walk the earth for the entire days of his life. But this time we're going to talk about the three Nephites who were blessed to walk the earth for their entire lives. And so, is that a blessing or a cursing? <laughs> Dr. Matt Bowman will talk about that. We're also going to get into UFOs. How is that related to alternative religion and the rise of the nuns? So, it's an interesting connection he's made. I think you won't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. Um, another good example of this is um, three Nephite stories. Well, and that's what I was going to mention yeah. because mm -hmm. we think of the three Nephites, they were so righteous that they lived forever, but why is Cain, a very unrighteous person, allowed to live forever? Yeah, yeah. What, well, what so, do you think? Uh, in Genesis, God tells Cain you're going to wander the earth, right? And, and there are stories of Cain wandering the earth all the way back into the Middle Ages. So he's um, cursed with never dying. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, I mean, you'll see some of these folk tales, right? People say, well, what about the flood? And, and the answer to that is that he clung to the outside of the ark during the flood. <laughs> and, 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 and yeah, that's, that's kind of the curse, right? Now, now, of course, this, again, points to a lot of kind of archetypes, right? Um, one of the famous ones that you see back in the Middle Ages is the archetype of the wandering Jew, um, which is a Christian folk tale from the Middle Ages about this sort of sometimes evil, sometimes not, but this wandering Jewish figure who it is said, you know, maybe mocked Christ on the cross or something like that, but it's cursed in similar ways. Hmm. Um, so again, right, you can see how this sort of Cain legend echoes with other kind of racist stories um, over the years. Well, it's strange to me, and, you know, I probably have some non- LDS listeners that don't know who the three Nephites are. And in fact, I will say this, especially since we recently had a Community of Christ historian Mark Shearer mm -hmm. on, uh, one of the apostles, his daughter said, "What? what's the three Nephites? Because apparently that's not a thing in the Community mm -hmm. of Christ. Um, so it's interesting that Cain is cursed with never dying. Mm -hmm. But the three Nephites are blessed with mm -hmm. never dying. I mean, can you and, and according to the Doctrine and Covenants, the Apostle John, too, right? right. There, there's, lot, there's lots of these people wandering around out so there. So why apparently. is one a blessing and one is a cursing? <laughs> yeah. Um, so Cain's curse, right? This is, it's not explicitly stated um, in the book of Genesis that he will live forever, right? This appears, I think, to come out of these other European folk tales, um, about people who are cast out, cursed, never to rest, right? Never to have a home, to wander forever. Um, in the Doctrine and Covenants and in the Book of Mormon, when the Apostle John and then the, these three Nephites are told they will live forever, it is a blessing because they are specifically given work to do. Right. Um, that is, they're told, right, you will go and be missionaries, you will, you will further the work of God, um, and that's a righteous task given to them. And of course, right, there a, a whole, you know, folklore legendarium grows up around them too. <laughs> Stories of these of these mysterious helpful figures who appear um, and then vanish mysteriously, and and just as with Cain, right, with stories, LDS some um, stories of Cain get intertwined with broader patterns in American folklore, and this happens to the three Nephites as well. Yeah. And, so explain how the three Nephites get called in the first sure. place. Sure. Yeah. So they are figures in the Book of Mormon. Um, when Jesus Christ appears in the Book of Mormon to this Nephite civilization, um, he calls twelve apostles, as he does in the Bible in um, the Gospels. And he gives them things. And three of these apostles ask, they say, you know, we want to stay on the earth until Christ comes again in order to further his work, um, to serve kind of as eternal missionaries, um, guides, um, people who are teaching about Jesus throughout human history. And in the LDS church, right, this folklore grows up around these figures. Um, they become, right, oh, and, and again, this is kind of a, broad folklore art type, right? These sort of helpful supernatural creatures that appear, do good work, and then vanish. That's a really, really old trope in Western folklore as well. And it becomes, in the mid-20th century, stories of the three Nephites become intertwined with some of these broader folklore patterns. The most famous um, of these is the vanishing hitchhiker motif, um, which is a 
archetype that you will see in American folklore dating way, way back, uh, but it becomes particularly pronounced after World War II with the rise of the automobile as sort of a convenient thing, a leisure activity, um, and especially something that young people do. You know, but I mean, of course, there's all sorts of famous tropes of this, right? The movie American Graffiti and so on and so forth, right? About young people driving all over the place as a leisure activity. And there emerges, um, most famously maybe in Chicago, but certainly around the entire country, this archetype ghost story. A young person is driving by themselves. They see a hitchhiker. Um, Often this hitchhiker, often, not always, but often this hitchhiker is a young woman who appears lost, um, confused, puzzled, frightened, and this The driver, who is often in the folklore a young man, um, is chivalrous. He stops to help this young woman. He picks her up. They have a conversation. She says some kind of enigmatic and strange things. Um, He takes her to her home. He stops. Sometimes she's sitting in the back seat, and when he turns around, she's vanished. She's gone. She's no longer in the car. He goes to the house to ask what's going on. And he discovers that this young person he's picked up is the dead child of this couple who live here. Sometimes he goes to the cemetery and sees her grave. Sometimes he will, like, give her a coat or his jacket to keep her warm. He goes to her grave. He finds it sitting on her grave, right? This is a famous, famous ghost story, one of the most famous ghost stories in, in American culture. Um, and it, it's, it's replicated in local patterns all over the country. You can go to many, many cities find versions of this story in which they say, this is the house, and this is the grave, and this is the name of the dead girl who stands on the side of this road um, in Chicago. Her name is Resurrection Mary, and there's a specific stretch of highway in South Chicago where she is often seen. Hmm. You know, it's a really famous story. Anyhow, just as in the 1980s, um, this LDS strand of Cain folklore, folklore blends with Bigfoot folklore, Um, So do we start seeing in the 50s and 60s the emergence of folk tales that blend three Nephite stories with the vanishing hitchhiker motif. So the person picked up is not a young woman. It's usually an older man. Um, Sometimes you can find in in earlier versions of this, it's an older Native American man. Okay. Um, And he will sit in the back seat. He will talk about Jesus. Um, He often gives warnings. He will tell people, um, be sure you have enough food storage or you should go to the temple. Um, And then he vanishes. And then, of course, his warnings, his advice proves to be, you know, to have foresight to it. Mm -hmm. Um, That this family suffers a disaster and they survive because of their food storage, right? Or they go to the temple and discover that they're given the name of an ancestor. Um, Something like that. Right. And it's a really, you know, and there, there have been studies done by this by folklorists like Wayland Hand, particularly um, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, um, that I really kind of modeled my work on Bigfoot after, right? Okay. Seeing the same kind of pattern of how this, this, these folk tales are a way by which Latter day Saints become integrated with American culture, that they take on the kind of motifs um, and the patterns of broader American society. Wow, that's interesting. I know Chris Thomas, um, he has uh, he's said, if anybody wants a good PhD ID, idea, do the three Nephite stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right? I mean, even yeah. in my mission, and I went on my mission in the 80s, um, our mission president blessed our mission um, to have the three Nephites come and perform miracles. And mm-hmm. so, you know... <laughs> It, there's still three Nephite stories happening yeah. today. and especially there, right? There's a famous article um, by the LDS folklore um, scholar um, William Wilson called On Being Human, the Folklore of Mormon Missionaries, and it's, it's, a, it's a kind of seminal piece uh, the Mormon academics read. And he argues there essentially that m- Mormon missions are one spot where this folklore really thrives, yeah. and particularly... Um, folklore with like supernatural bent 
Yeah. Uh, much Any, more anything so that's a miracle or mm-hmm. unexplained, well, it must have been the three knee fights. Yeah. Yeah. Precisely. Precisely. Right. And it, it, just, you know, it, it, missions are a hot house for these sorts of stories. They just get passed around and exchanged and, and amped up. And then people leave missions and take them home. Right. Mm-hmm. It, it's a way, right, that, that uh, they were kind of a seedbed um, for lots of other versions of, of LDS folklore. Well, very good. Well, let's segue into your UFO book. Are there, first of all, are there any LDS ties to that or Mormon ties to your L- there UFO book? There are not, but that's not to say there is not LDS UFO folklore because there is a great deal. <laughs> um, and there, there's lots of very interesting kind of um, LDS UFO thought. Nice. Now, um, what's certainly. the name of your book and when and where is it coming out? Uh, the book is called The Abduction of Betty and Barney Hill. Okay. And it is being published by Yale University Press, August 29th, 2023. Oh, so by the time this is published, it will be out. I, uh, great. <laughs> I hope everyone <laughs> buys two copies. <laughs> so tell us more about what got you into UFOs. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Was it Bigfoot? <laughs> yeah, it, go, it goes back quite a ways, actually, and in part to Bigfoot, right? I, I was on, so I said a, a little while ago, that Big Folk article was my first academic publication. Um, and that was done because I was invited to be on a panel at, at the Mormon History Association. I believe it was 2020, or 2005, actually. Yeah, 2005. Wow. Um, on the supernatural and LDS folklore. One of my other panelists, a guy named Mike Van Wagenen, who teaches in Georgia now, um, did an article on LDS um, UFO folklore. Um, and that kind of got me interested in that, into thinking about that. But more broadly, I think I was, I'm interested in the 20th century. That's my kind of major area of, re, of academic research and scholarship. And I'm particularly interested in, in what happens to religion in the 20th century. Um, there w- emerged in the mid 20th century this story that a lot of scholars bought into for a long time, and that was what's called the secularization thesis, which is this idea that as societies grow more scientific, um, more bureaucratic, um, more meritocratic, as the authorities of our societies become more and more experts in fields, you know, doctors with training take over medicine, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Professional trained scientists with degrees take over science. This is all unlike, you know, the 1600s and 1700s when everyone kind of did everything, um, right? When doctors were barbers, when when the the leading scientists were people like Benjamin Franklin, right? Who were just kind of like went in their backyard and did things. (laughs) Um, Yeah, exactly. You know, (laughs) or, you know, these kind of wealthy guys of leisure said, oh, I'm going to be a scientist. And they just start doing experiments, right? By the time you hit the 20th century, that's gone, right? We have training, and we allocate the authority in our society to people with training. And that means often that the people who were the real intellectual and social and cultural leaders in, it, in our society um, in the 1600s were ministers, were leaders of religious um, groups. So religion, so the th- this thesis goes, becomes increasingly boxed in. The territory the religion takes up in our lives shrinks, right? It becomes something that you do on Sunday, not something that runs your life. Mm -hmm. Um, Science becomes the primary explanatory mechanism of our society. We don't say, right, that the rain comes down because God sent it. We say the rain came down because clouds were doing X and Y and Z, right? Right. Um, So according to secularization theorists, as all that happened, people would stop being religious. Religion would just go away, right? It would leave. It would fade. It turns out that didn't happen at all. Two things happen instead. One is religion is actually surging. And traditional religion, that is to say denominational religion, the great religious traditions, quote-unquote, Islam, Christianity, um, you know, Islam is doing very, very well, especially in the global south. Um, Christianity is doing very, very well in the global south. It is true that in the north, In the global north, I'm talking here primarily Europe and North America, institutional religion, traditional churches, denominations are declining in membership. However, at the same time, more and more people are pursuing other 
practices or beliefs that we might call religion. Astrology is booming. Tarot card readings are booming. Um, new Age practices, what some people call energy work or light work, are booming. They're doing incredibly well. So it turns out that religion doesn't go away. It just starts taking on new forms. And that, to tie this all the way back around, that is why I grew interested in UFOs. Okay. Um, because so you reject the secularism I reject the secularization thesis. I think religion changes. It doesn't fade. It doesn't vanish. Um, so even in Europe, people are doing tarot cards and, mm-hmm. and astrology yes. and New Age a- stuff? A ten- so take Britain, for instance. Um, in Great Britain, church attendance is down, you know, 10%, right? Very few people are going to traditional Anglican churches um, on Sunday for the Eucharist. That's down. However, a great number of British people, upwards of two-thirds, have told pollsters that they believe in guardian angels. Hmm. Um, Many, many people who say, I'm not part of any religion in particular, pray or meditate or, you know, or do energy work, right? These sorts of alternative practices are very much alive um, and very much with us. And in the most recent poll, 42% of Americans have told pollsters they believe in UFOs. And not just in UFOs, right? Because, you know, when you say UFO, all that really means is a weird thing in the sky, an unidentified flying object, right? And, it, and it's true. I think one of the things I track in this book is how weird thing in the sky becomes a craft piloted by extraterrestrial intelligences. Because that's not an obvious connection, right? These things might have been anything. Um, And certainly, if you you believe in some UFO researchers, they will say, go back to the ancient world. Go back to Greece and Rome and ancient China. They're seeing strange things in the sky. They did not think they were craft piloted by extraterrestrial intelligences because the idea that you could build a craft and fly it um, was not terribly um, prominent then. But they thought, right, they, they gave them other names. They said, these are demons, these are angels, these are ghosts, these are spirits. So there have been odd things seen in, our, in the skies as long as humans have been alive. What happens after World War II, when there is a, a burst of these sightings, UFO people say there was a flap, that's the word they use, a flap of UFO sightings, between 1947 and 1952, what happens then is, because this is the age of airplanes, it's the age of jet flyers, it's the age of rockets, right? They assume these things must be built. There must be technology. They must be something that someone made. And who made them? Well, initially, some people in the military think it was maybe the Russians, right? Of course it's the Russians. It's always the Russians in the (laughs) 1940s and 1950s. Um, But Many other people start to think, well, maybe it wasn't the Russians. Maybe it was extraterrestrials. Maybe it was someone from another planet who built these. And that gradually becomes the dominant explanation for these things in the sky. Now, what's, I think, really interesting about this, and this is also something I chart in the book, in the 1970s, especially the 1970s, which the 1970s is the great, decade of what we call the New Age movement. Now, the New Age movement is not, you know, calling it that implies that it's one thing. It's like one kind of thing with a leader and a consistent ideology, and that's not the case at all. Uh, But it is kind of a useful catch-all that scholars use to describe this real explosion of what might also be called alternative practices, things that are outside the mainstream, things that mainstream religious movements in particular aren't doing. Often these, um, these were inspired by Asia. Um, in 1965, Congress lifted immigration restrictions on Asia, and so you got a whole wave of migrants from the Indian subcontinent, um, from Japan, from Korea, coming to the United States and bringing with them Hinduism and Buddhism and transcendental meditation and ideas of karma and reincarnation, right? And, and so those things start spreading in American culture in the, in the 60s. But at the same time, you also have a real revival Um, in traditional European occultic practices. And I'm talking here like things like ritual magic, um, psychic power, stuff like that. Crystal balls. Crystal balls, right? Even crystals, right, as the concept, pyramid magic, all that kind of stuff. And what happens in the 1970s is that 
a lot of this stuff starts getting published. And bookstores become just real hubs of spreading these sorts of ideas, right? You, you start to see in the 70s, um, and in the 80s particularly, um, people like Starhawk, who is one of the kind of founders of Wicca um, in the United States, her handbook, you know, for the, uh, for the oh, I forget the title of it, but something like the Handbook of Practitioner for the Solitary Witch, really explodes. Um, you start to see reading groups um, looking into things like psychic power and channeling, um, astral projection, aura reading. All of this stuff becomes incredibly popular in the 70s, and UFOs get plugged into that. And so by the 70s, there's a lot of people who are associating UFOs not simply with kind of hard science, with saying, well, these are, you know, this, these are people from another planet who built a craft and flew it here, but UFOs are also representatives of higher levels of intelligence, of cosmic intelligence that have been sent here to help us, to help human beings transcend ourselves and to, to make our way to the next level of consciousness. They communicate with us psychically. Um, right, we can we can channel um, UFO intelligences and write, you know, in the same way that that you know Joseph Smith wrote the Book of Mormon. Right, we can UFO people will put thoughts in our mind and then we'll write them down. And there's a number of books produced like that, UFO scripture in a way. I saw so, something mm -hmm. on. I want to say formerly the History Channel mm -hmm. because it seems like the well they have the ancient aliens. The ancient aliens, yes. And there there was one about. Uh, a, an alien in, from, and it wasn't Kolob, it was some other weird place that came to Joseph Smith, and so it wasn't an angel, it was an alien. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, where do they get this garbage? Yeah. It comes largely from a man named Eric von Donneken, um, who is a, he's Swiss, um, he's a hotel manager, and in the late 1960s, he publishes a book called Chariots of the Gods. And this book argues that not simply Joseph Smith, but more or less every prophetic figure throughout human history was either an extraterrestrial or inspired by extraterrestrials. Oh, wow. So his argument, right? And it's interesting because his argument shows, I think, how powerfully science as a concept has kind of taken over the Western world, right? This is to say God is not some sort of supernatural being He's an alien. Who, who flashes in and out of our dimension and who can make miracles happen by waving his hand, right? God is a being who lives on another planet who is simply very far advanced scientifically than we are. And so Von Donneken argues quite explicitly. He'll go back to the ancient Babylonians, the Sumerians, the Mayans. He'll look at their art um, he'll look at their folklore, their stories of their religion. Um, he'll look at the Bible. The and pyramids, say, too? Because, mm -hmm. you know, the pyramids were built by aliens. Everybody precisely. knows that. Yeah, precisely, right? Because, and he'll say, well, he'll look at the Bible and say, look, in Ezekiel, the opening chapters of Ezekiel, right? Ezekiel has this great vision. And in this vision, Ezekiel says that he saw angels um, in the heavens surrounded by flaming wheels. And he'll be well, flaming wheels, right? That must be, that's a, that's a spaceship. Ezekiel is trying to describe a spaceship, but he doesn't have the, the language for it. So we get this very bizarre kind of description, but what it really is is a spaceship. He'll look at the Sumerians and say very similar things, right? He'll say, like, the Sumerians had this story of this god on Onanis who came, who came to Earth and taught them math. And he's like, oh, well, that's obviously an alien too. Um, he'll look at Mayan art and say, this piece of Mayan art very clearly depicts someone wearing a space suit, a space helmet, right? And so what he's doing here is trying to turn this category of religion and this idea of like supernatural creatures who can work miracles, he's trying to turn it into science. And, and he does saying, that with Joseph Smith too. Yes, precisely. That's crazy. Right? And, and that, well, I think the fascinating thing here, and this will plug in a bit to how um, UFO folk folklore um, becomes embedded in Mormonism, is that there's a really powerful discourse in LDS theology, going back to Brigham Young, but then especially progressing through early 20th century apostles um, like John Witzow and, and B.H. Roberts, of um, what has sometimes been called materialism or scientism, which is to say, right, there's nothing supernatural, everything is material. 
Um, John Witso says fairly explicitly that God is a great scientist. Well, and Brigham Young said something similar mm-hmm. too. So this sounds very Mormon in a way. Yeah, exactly. And I think that kind of strain, that kind of commonsensical strain of thought um, in Mormon theology that goes through Brigham Young through these early 20th century thinkers has meant that you, when you look at some um, Mormons who are interested in UFO work, um, they will invoke this, and they will sound a lot like Eric von Donneke. Um, there's a, a, one of the most famous of these people is a, a lawyer named um, James Thompson, um, who has written a number of, he's a ghostwriter, but he's also written a number of books um, for LDS audiences, and he's written a book um, about UFOs, and he argues essentially this. He says that we know from the language of people like Brigham Young, right, that God has children on multiple planets, on multiple worlds. Um, Spencer W. Kimball said something similar. And some of them are probably more righteous than we are. And if they're more righteous than we are, they're more advanced technologically. And so they're probably building spaceships and flying them to our planet to help us. Right? And that's his argument, essentially. That's what UFOs are, is that they are they are righteous societies on other planets who have come to help us of hmm. progress in the gospel. Right? And he's, you know, he, he is doing kind of the same thing Vaudonican is doing, but he's drawing on both. And uh, this goes back, right, to uh, to Bigfoot and to the three Nephites, right? He's taking this broader cultural story, this folkloric strain of UFOs, and he's saying, how will this, how can this work? How can I intertwine this with my Mormon heritage and my Mormon traditions and the stories and the ideas prevalent within Mormonism. This sounds a little bit like the Mormon Transhumanist Association. Is there a relationship there? Yeah, you know, that's interesting. Um, Transhumanism is such a... um, There's so many different strands of it. But yeah, you can see, I think, especially with the Mormon Transhumanist Association, the same idea that everything fundamentally is scientific. That science is not simply another kind of invented human language for describing the world, like so many of our other languages are, but science is actually real. The world, the universe actually is scientific. Therefore, God is scientific. God is a scientist. And all of the things that we ascribe to God, these kind of mystical powers, splitting the Red Sea, raising people from the dead, right? None of that actually violates or transcends or overcomes the the laws of nature which is what you will find in some um, traditional Christian theology, right? That God is outside his creation, and so he can just override the laws of how the world usually works if he wants to. Transhumanists will say, no, it's actually not like that. The the task of raising someone from the dead is a scientific task. We just don't know how to do it, but God knows how to do it. Um, He can reconnect, you know, and reinvigorate our atoms and molecules and cells um, scientifically. So, yeah, transhumanism is, you know, it's very interesting, right? Because traditional transhumanists um, would say religion is silly. Religion is bunk uh, because it's not, it's anti-scientific, right? Which is not, I mean, that, that's a very much a Western narrative that I think comes out of the um, creationist evolutionist debates of the mm-hmm. early 20th century. Um, but transhumanists in the United States are very marked by that. They kind of perceive religion and science as being warring ideas. And you can be one or the other, but you can't be both. Um, which I think, ironically, a lot of kind of religious people and atheists buy into that. Um, It's not necessarily true, but Mormon transhumanists say it's not true, right? Their assertion is religion and science are the same thing, ultimately. And these these atheist transhumanists, on the one hand, they don't recognize that, and a lot of religious people don't recognize that either. So Mormon transhumanists are trying to bridge that gap and say, no, you guys are actually doing the same thing. You just have to talk to each other. (laughs) That's interesting. Um, you know, as, as we were talking there, is there anything else about the UFOs before we move on? Do oh, there's so mention? much to say about <laughs> UFOs. <laughs> but uh, uh, but where, wherever you want to go, it's fine. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Matthew Bowman. In our next conversation, he's going to make the case that cults and brainwashing don't exist. I do that even with a Marshall Applewhite, yes, a Jim absolutely. Jones. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I mean, those are two mass yeah. murderers, especially. Yeah. yeah. Well, but we, we, you still don't like to use the no. word cult with those. No. Here is why. 
If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, subscribe on either Patreon or at GospelTangents.com. For just $5 a month, you can hear the entire audio uninterrupted. On our $10 tier, if you'd like to see the whole video, you can see that uh, either on YouTube.com slash GospelTangents, or I've got a special Facebook group devoted for uh, full videos. So subscribe at GospelTangents.com and uh, sign up for just $10 a month. For $20 a month, if you'd like to get some bonus content, uh, maybe some of the stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor, you can sign up for that. And then if you'd like to talk to me for $100 a month, we'll, we'll do a monthly phone call on something like Zoom, and you can ask me anything you want. So thanks again. Also, don't forget about the merch, mugs, t-shirts, um, hats, things like that. I'm trying to get the ties up there. Hopefully I can get up up there. And uh, thanks again for watching Gospel Tangents. And click here for some more videos.